Good morning. Have you guys had your coffee? Robert Lenti from the Vocal Dish Studio, author of the Four Pillars of Singing Book online course that you guys are on. This is the uh, weekly Q&A student support call. We'll try this on uh, Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. right here at the TVS group on Facebook and um, see how it goes. Um, the uh, Four Pillars of Singing, the course is comprehensive, no doubt about it, and it takes a little bit of practice, uh, not only training, you know, doing your workouts, but uh, a little bit of patience and practice on how to click around and get to the, uh, you know, in the course, how to work with the course and all that. So I want to make sure that uh, my uh, students and customers have an opportunity to speak to me personally and answer questions about how to use the program, the user interface, and of course, the methodology, training techniques, and all that. So the way this is gonna work is um, uh, go out to thevocalishstudio.com, go to my website, and post your question there. You have to give me your email address, post your question there, and then I will uh, answer your questions for you. Okay. Hey Michael, I hope things have been going well for you, man. It's been a long time since we spoke. You know, um, when we last spoke, you were going to uh, talk about how you could uh, help drive this uh, this group. Well, you may have noticed the group's been growing, so uh, I could really use your help. I'm still looking for sort of group community management um, assistance on that, if you'd like. Uh, send me an email offline and we can talk more about it, and I'm happy to uh, remunerate you for your time and effort to help out. You know, maybe some lessons, maybe you know, something nice, some microphones. I got a bunch of them here. All right, Andrea. Great, Robert. Greetings from Rome. Cool, cool. Hey, Andrea. Boo. <laughs> yes, yes. My homies from Pescara, from Pescara, Italy. Andrea, uh, uh, fantastic. So this last spring, I went to uh, uh, Europe, which included Italy, and did a training vocal athletes master class for uh, singing students and teachers. I was partnering with a, a TVS certified instructor, Patrizia Torrieri, hope I'm saying that right, um, in the lovely town of Pescara, Italy. And um, we had a song coaching day, and uh, one day um, Andrea, um, Andrea came in, yeah, and uh, um, did a super, super cool um, sort of Middle Eastern a cappella, um, I think it was the original the song, it was a cappella, it had sort of Middle Eastern scales and intervals to it. So cool, so cool. And we got it on video. <laughs> got, a, got a video so maybe you guys will see it on YouTube soon <laughs> alright do you have any questions here cool yeah great I love the uh, chat with you guys but um, I want to try to um, and we can do that that's fine but I want to um, answer questions for people that are trying to click around and get in the course and stuff uh, hi, Gina. <laughs> Poor Gina. Hope everything's everything's going well for you and you're getting it sorted out. Um, Gina, if you still have questions about where to go, what to do, where the stuff is, um, uh, send me a your questions on on the chat system at the Bubble Studio. So here's how this works, guys. I don't want to use this chat system on Facebook for questions. I want to encourage students to go to the Vocalist Studio, go to my website, and down below on the bottom right hand, my other right, bottom right hand corner is a little chat icon, pop up with the chat icon, and give me your email and give me your questions. I want to be able to um, preserve 
your questions so we can go back and 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 answer them maybe after the after the little broadcast here by the way i'm only going to be here for an hour david marcy hey marcy appreciate all your support marcy you're really a good student and a good coach out of boise idaho a uh, teacher that's teaching the um tbs method in boise idaho I grew up in Idaho. Oh my God. And of course. <laughs> Freaking Richards. Richards, be on your best behavior. Don't bust my balls in here. All right. Serious. Richards, you're welcome to be here, but be a team player. Don't bust my balls. Anyways, I really like that. <laughs> I, really, I really dig that new video, the the one with the metal queen, um, where they had like the fire exploding behind, and then when she was like swinging the sword of the devil, dude, <laughs> that was so dope. That was great, man. That's why you're one of the greatest. <laughs> I'm just teasing you, dude. Just give me shit. All right. Any questions? Come on, you guys. Let's talk about some technique. I don't want to just set up here and hey Dan. Dan, where are you? Dan, are you in Seattle? Are you the, the Dan in Seattle that, that uh, took lessons with me on Fridays? I hope so. Um, if you're that Dan, I miss you, man. I miss you. Get back in here. I want to hear your voice when you get, get to work on that. Um, Gina, warm up for crying vocal fry. Okay. Okay, so Gina has a question about um, a physical mode called cry mode um, and um, how, to, how, to, how to warm up for it. Well, I'm going to grab my trusty rubber band, which is um, a metaphor for vocal folds. You see, these are the vocal folds. You can elongate them, you can short them, you can tilt them, you can do all kinds of cool things. So you voice coaches out there, really pretty cool tool for showing your students what the vocal folds will do. All right, now, um, cry, uh, cry vocal mode. You know, Gina, um, I wouldn't necessarily say that we're going to warm up for cry vocal mode, all right? Um, I mean, I suppose it sort of could, but it's m because because cry vocal mode is a physical mode that you need to get into when you are warming up. Okay, it's sort of cart before the horse. So um, when you warm up, you need to be in cry mode as opposed to. I'm gonna do something first, do a warm up, and then I will get into cry mode. I mean, I still put that sort of, sort of possible. You can kind of do that, but that's not really the approach nor the context. When we warm up our voice for singing, you do apply the physical mode, cry mode. All right. But what I can do, Gina, is I can, um, I can, I can show you the three step cry mode workflow game, all right? The three-step cry mode workflow game, which helps you to get into cry mode, helps you to feel cry mode. I wouldn't really say it's like a warm-up for cry mode. Sort of semantics, but anyways, I'll get on with it. By the way, by the way, what I'm about ready to tell you guys is one of the most important things in all the TVS techniques ever. All right? I mean, it's like one of the top five things. It's just, in my opinion, it's as important as vowels. So it's like number two, second only to vowels in importance. It, um, it addresses the physiology. Okay? Um, and your question, Gina, is sort of timely because... In the course, 
in the light course um, at, at, at Udemy and in the full course at my website at thevocalistudio.com, I just added last weekend, I just added three new lectures and lessons on cry mode. All right? And there's a free one on YouTube. I repeat, in regards to cry mode, because it's so important, I'm going to get to it, but I have to tell you this. There's a new free video on it on my YouTube channel, so go subscribe to my YouTube channel. And two, in the light version of the course at Udemy and Skillshare, and at the full version of my course, there are three new lessons and lectures on cry mode. And all of you, all you guys have got to go watch it. It, it's super important. Like I said, it's like the second most important thing next to vowels. All right, cry mode. When we cry, okay, with tears, okay, um, it puts the larynx into a unique position. It puts the larynx into a physical configuration, all right? And the physical configuration for crying is there to help us when we're crying, think babies or if you're in an emergency, um, to be able to amplify a really high note. Now there's more to it than that, but if there's an emergency and you're wailing, you need to emotionally cry, and babies are the best example. Because babies, you know, babies can't speak for themselves, so they have to get attention e immediately. It's a matter of survival. So the body has built in cry mode as a natural reflex, all right, to be able to be heard at a high volume at a high note. So think about it. High volume, high amplification at high frequencies. Hmm, 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 hmm. What would be helpful with that? What, what would that help? Uh, let's say crying and singing. Right, okay. So cry vocal mode is fantastic for two things, crying and singing. In fact, it's essential. All right. So when we put our, when we, when we start crying, we are the larynx, what happens is the vocal folds, elongate, okay, they actually elongate a little bit, and they thin out. Sometimes we refer to it as thinning out, okay? So I'm in cry mode right now, and the vocal folds will thin, thin out, all right? Now that, that thinning out, what that does is that increases, that increases, Adduction. You get hyper adduction. When you thin out your vocal folds, you see how that the pressure against this pin increases as I thin out and elongate my vocal folds? Same thing. Cry mode elongates the vocal folds and thins out. And that creates hyper adduction of the vocal folds. Good closure of the vocal folds. You need that for singing or if you're a baby crying. Okay? Two. Cry mode creates medial compression, meaning there's an equal distribution of pressure on the vocal folds on the surface area here. So, so that, that, that compression that we're talking about isn't out of balance. It's not only on the edges or, or forward, okay? It's actually as an even distribution in the surface area of the vocal folds. So you get, you get hyper reduction, and then you get an equal distribution of that compression on the surface area of the vocal folds. What that does, among other things, I'm oversimplifying, but what that helps, is that, that's, what, that's one, of the, one of the things that helps make the voice more stable and to sound more chesty about the passaggio in the head voice. All right? And three, cry mode removes pharyngeal constriction. I repeat, good cry mode removes pharyngeal constriction. What that translates to is a lot of the pushing, choking, and, and squeezing on high notes through vocal break sort of go away. Maybe not totally, but a lot of those problems will go away if you put the voice into cry mode. All right? Now, the three-step cry mode workflow game. 
Step one, I'm just going to speak to you in regular speech mode, like I'm like I am right now. Step two, I'm going to speak to you in cry mode, so that I can feel feel the voice in that position. When you're in cry mode, you can feel it. It's like you get like a little tug, like a little little tug on the musculature inside. You can feel it, and you want to really you really become very very sort of very intimate and very. I'm used to that feeling, all right? The feeling of in the larynx when you're in cry mode, all right? And three, while speaking in cry mode, I will then hold that position and roll my voice up through the passaggio into the head voice and sort of release a singing down, all right? One, hello, my name is Robert Lecce. I'm right, I'm on the Facebook Live Q&A session for my students and people that are taking the course, all right? I'm not in cry mode right now because I'm just speaking to you in regular speech mode, all right? Step two, okay, all right, now my voice is in cry mode, can you tell? Okay, because it sounds like my girl came over and broke my heart last night. She came over and broke my heart, it sounds like I've been crying, well, I'm about ready to cry. Can you hear it? You, you, we're all familiar with the sound color. It sounds like somebody's about ready to cry and it's sad. Now, obviously, I'm not emotionally sad, right? Okay, it's not about pretending to cry. This is not acting class, all right? This is this is the method acting. This is about singing through the physical configuration of the larynx when we cry, but it's not about acting like we said, okay? So anyways, I'm arbitrarily putting the voice into cry mode. I have high reduction of vocal folds, medial compression, and pharyngeal constriction has gone away. Step three, here we go. Whoa, 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 whoa. All of that is just command and control of the cry reflex. Great singing is command and control of the cry reflex. So start training it. And like I said, in the course, light and full, there are three new uh, lectures. Um, we go through that three-step uh, cry mode workflow game, and then there's a couple other ideas in there that help you guys get into cry mode. So Gina, do that. Play that game that I just showed you. And on all of your warm-ups, all of your training, all your singing, do be mindful, conscious of doing it through a larynx that is in a cry position. All right, next, what do we got here? All right, Gina, warm up for crying. Gina, cry mode and fry mode are sort of the same thing. So if you go to the pulse and the pulse and release onset inside the course, the pulse and release onset, it's very similar, okay? Pulse register, pulse is sort of fancy voice lesson talk for a vocal fry. All right. Ooh, got a thumbs up from Draven. It must be doing okay. All right, Gina, Draven, Robert, remind me to show you how I use the mm -hmm, the straw to help reinforce cry mode. Absolutely. Um, in my new upcoming warm up course, um, I'm I am showing students different methods of warming up. Okay, and no doubt the the straw thing is in there. The guy that can do the best straw warm up is um, my buddy Draven and TBS certified instructor out in Colorado. Um, yeah, yeah, muscle memory, yeah, it's good, it's super good. The straw. I have a bucket of straws over here for the straw warm up, by the way, and they're all cut in half. Javen cut them for me. I need to get better at it, but yeah. Um, Definitely a valid point. I have never coached an opera singer. Do you have suggestions? Ah, Marcy. Marcy asked, do I have suggestions for opera singers? Marcy, pretty much all of the techniques that we train in TVS in the book, the onsets, the the workouts, the sirens, the, the, uh, um, the, the vowels, all of that is relevant 
to any singer, including opera singers. Okay? But the thing is, 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 is what makes sort of contemporary and opera singers different. There's several things. I'm not going to get into all of it right now. But one thing is for sure is the formants. The formants often the tuning of the vowels and the resonance can be a little different. And oftentimes opera singers have a little bit more, they have more closed quotient on the vocal folds, which is actually technically a good thing, which is one reason why they, they sound so great. Um, so um, what, what I would encourage you to do is train an opera singer like a vocal athlete, work with the techniques in TDS to help them get stronger and build their motor skills and get more coordinated, all right? Now to help them sound like an opera singer, um, what I would do is I would be very careful when they're training, which we might not do with contemporary students so much, but be very careful about helping them to keep their larynx down and in particular on the closed vowels mercy on e, u, er, um, i, um, and to some extent, oh, on these closed language vowels, don't let your opera singers modify or distort those vowels. You're right? Encourage them to sing through the narrowed vowels, which, as you know, are more difficult. Now, a contemporary singer can kind of get away with maybe opening up those narrow vowels a little bit more. Um, it, it, stylistically, it may even be preferred. But if I was working with an opera singer, I would be focusing about 80% on just getting them healthy, get, make them run around the track with all the techniques that we have here. And then to help them sound like an opera singer, I would focus a lot on helping them to find the resonance for those closed vowels, which is sort of the hard work. Um, that's the way I would approach it. Uh, hey, Daniel, hopefully you heard that. What do they need in terms of instruction? I see. Hey, Paula. Jennifer, oh, this is Jennifer. Jennifer. Hello, Jennifer. Okay. Okay. How important, uh, Paul says, how important is it to a singer on tour not to talk after a concert with all the noise and smoke of a venue? Hmm. Well, if you're on tour and you need to preserve your voice and you're, and you're talking in a bar where you have to raise your speaking voice and you get sort of fatigued doing that and there's smoke and other elements in the air that really, you know, all things being equal are not healthy, you know what I'd do? Is I would, one, actually not talk as much. Go to the bus, go to the hotel room and relax, okay? But, you know, if you have to communicate, I would make sure that as I'm as I'm communicating two things that resonance that I would be not communicating down here in my throat where it's a little bit more grindy, but I try to amplify my voice up here in the mask, okay? And I would make sure that I buzz on nasals. So as I speak to you, every time every time I come across a nasal, try to buzz through it. What that would do is kind of help preserve some good healthy compression and keep the resonance up in, in your mask. This is speaking health tips. Um, also, I think like warm minty tea is very helpful. That's what I would do. Um, best thing you can do is just hit the bus, go to the hotel, get some sleep. All right, Joe, I just bought the course this week. When I bought the first time, it was called the Four Pillars of Screaming. Man, that's old school. Looking forward to expanding my range. Uh, more or some better, blah, blah, blah. I need to do some Zeppelin. Okay. If you want to do some Zeppelin, cry mode. I mean, all, all of it, but in particular, 
uh, cry mode. I was teaching a student um, a whole lot of love. I was coaching a whole lot of love about two weeks ago. And um, we a big part of helping the student get into a whole lot of love was getting into cry mode. Okay. And man, I was actually, I'm, don't put me on the spot. I'm not going to do it right now, right here. Okay. In this uncontrolled environment. But I was singing it with my students like, wow, yeah, it's very, it's very uh, Robert Plant ish. But I actually felt like I was sort of channeling Robert Plant for a moment um, by just focusing on being in cry mode and all the benefits that I'm getting from that recently. But anyways, Joe, it's good to have you. Joe has um, purchased the training program when it was the four pillars of screaming. That's going to be like eight years ago. And uh, cool. Joe, good to have you. I hope you like all the new updates that, that we put together. You're welcome so much, Marcy. Sergio. So cool. Sergio is awesome. Sergio Calafiera, my good friend and fantastic voice coach in, um, God help me, Cagliari, Cagliari, Italy, on the island of Sardinia. Um, I was there this last spring as well. Sergio, it's great to see you, buddy. I, I just love you. You're the coolest dude. Say hi to little Serge for me. Sergio just got a new cat. Little Serge. Gavin again. Gina, adduction is your friend, no doubt. Women's voices are inherently weaker above the speaking range. We need to train hard onsets in the head range and pull the compression down into the chest range. That's really good. I like that, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hard onsets, Gina, hard onsets. Go to the TVS program and look at attack and release onsets. Attack and release onsets. Uh, these are the glottal attacks. Those are hard onsets. That'll help you a lot. I need to go out here and check out the questions on Sumo. Hang on, guys. Throw coat T. Uh, it's okay. I recommend um, regards to T. Gina um, actually invented this T for singers. It's called Singers T. It's great. It. It, it really helps. I, um, go, go check it out. Go to singerst.com. Cool. Thanks, man. You're the best. Rock on. Ah, oh, you're welcome. Best way you can thank me is to uh, give me a good review on the on the on the course system. I really appreciate that. Working hard for you guys this morning. Throat coat tea is awesome. Is it right, Sir Joe? How you doing, Serge? By the way, I mean, you guys go out to Sergio Calafura's website and listen to this guy sing. It's unbelievable. I mean, he cha when he sings heavy metal, he channels Chris Cornell. He's just so great. Really talented. I turn down the lights. The lights are killing me. Here we go. Uh, this is part of the story where I do a chat dance, maybe. I'm sort of disappointed that Facebook Live doesn't have a screen share option. Darn. Hmm. Oh, well. oh, geez, more stuff. Serge, the opening of the mouth when it affects the delivery of the vocal cords. Wow, that's a really good question. What is your opinion of the new trend of no-name guys doing vocal coach? That's a really great question, Kevin. Sergio, how important is the opening of the mouth for yeah, Sergio? <laughs> Serge, you gotta like, sort of like figure out the English. <laughs> how how important is the opening of the mouth for a good supply of the vocal cords? Well, in the book, in the course, um, I talk about the Empouchure, all right? Now, empouchure is sort of fancy French for this, all right? Tongue, teeth, lips, jaw, how you, how you hold your, your tongue, teeth, lips, jaw. And um, 
I have found that my experience personally and for sure working with students that if you, as a general rule, it's not strictly absolute, okay, but as a general rule, if you see through a horizontal orientation, a horizontal embouchure, okay, as opposed to sort of a vertical position, you get some benefits from this. Um, one, singing through a little bit more about horizontal embouchure, what it does is it tends to make the tongue go to work more. So in regards that in regards to the need to articulate consonants and vowels better when we're singing, a horizontal position tends to make the, the tongue move more. The tongue becomes more articulate. It gets more involved in your singing. Uh, I don't know exactly why, I just just to happen to notice that's what happens. And if you can get your tongue articulating more and more involved in the formation of consonants and vowels versus the mandible, the, the jawbone going up and down, then what happens is your diction, the articulation of your lyrics tends to drastically improve. Two, a horizontal embouchure tends to amplify the sound better. Uh, um, so if, if this is my oral cavity and I'm in a vertical position, this is sort of my, the pen represents resonance or sound energy, okay? As I close my oral cavity and move to the horizontal position, the energy is amplified. Okay, so you get you tend to get a little more amplification of the resonance inside the oral cavity when you're in horizontal position. And three, that includes oftentimes a little bit of ping off your teeth. The the sound energy can hit your teeth, and and that helps contribute to the color, the raw color. Um, and it's a subjective thing, but in my opinion. It's good. It's good to get a little bit of enamel, a little bit of teeth, sound color in your vowels. Um, but most of all, it's just great because it gets your tongue moving more efficiently, and it's it's nice for the narrow vowels. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, Serge, but I think that given that you are a student of TVS, my guess is that you probably – already knew that. I mean, that's sort of new. I mean, and then that's, that's not new to you, but yeah, the horizontal embouchure is very helpful. Super helpful. Good question, Serge. What is my opinion to the Serge? How important is the opening of the mouth? I hope I answered that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, try mouth opening helps in intonate the formants. If the notes go up, the jaw goes down. Mm, yeah, it wants to, but I don't don't think it has to, Kevin. And if you drop the the, the jaw, you got you know the mandible bone is a big hingy thing. It's a big clunky hingy thing. If you're if you're doing this, that's a lot. That's a lot of travel. It's a lot of distance you have to move to articulate something quickly. I agree with your statement, but I'm only saying that if you can train the palate and the tongue and the upper vocal tract to do more articulation work and not rely on the jaw. I think you get more efficiency that way. Um, opinion of the new trend of no name coaches doing reaction videos. Uh, At face value, it seems seems fine. Whatever you know, whatever floats their boat. If the if the comments and stuff are good ideas and sound intelligent, um, then I suppose it's helpful. 
for some people. And, um, uh, and, and, and I, I think I think it has like you know sort of entertaining. It's high on entertainment factor. Um, I don't have any problem with it. I mean, it's not my place to have a problem with it. I think it's fine. Uh, if I were to do some reaction videos, here's how I would feel. One, I would feel uh, I would feel like it's only entertainment. Like like I'm doing something for you guys that's sort of fun or funny. And then I'm doing like an entertainment video. It does. It's not training in my book. That's not training. That's not teaching. Not really. It's staring at a video, hitting pause and play, pause and play, and making comments. That's okay. I'm not saying anything wrong with that. It's perfectly fine. It's fun. It's sort of informative. It's a new vibe. But... If you're looking to be entertained, go, go, go for that. But if you're really looking to get information to go train and get lasting results, I don't really think that's the, the format to go get it. But I don't know. It's fine. No harm in that. Provided that no harm in that, provided that the comments are, are smart and well thought out. Um, where it becomes a problem is when it becomes defamation videos. When it becomes videos that criticize other people and put other people down and make fun of other people, that's when it's horse shit. Okay. But if you're just watching a video and making comments about the mouth and the crime mode, whatever, great. Good stuff. Good entertainment. I wouldn't call it training though. It's not really a lecture. So I would feel sort of silly doing it, but maybe I'll try a few. I thought about maybe doing it with my students the videos of my students singing or even my own videos singing and sort of I liked it what I did there I didn't like what I did there thought I might try it that way Serge hope everything's going great for you and Kevin Fiera I, I read your post on the uh, lizard deal also I got to follow up with Tony mouth opening home Santone Troy 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 tips for dropping constriction before and after the passaggio Troy Go out to the course, all right, and go to physical modes, all right, and watch the three new videos that I posted this weekend on cry mode, okay, and practice those techniques. Do that, okay? Do the course, physical modes, cry vocal mode techniques. Jimmy Zamardi, wow. Jimmy Zamardi. Bro, we're going on, wow, it's been like 10 years or something. Send me a personal email. I'd like to uh, hear what you've been up to and see how things are going. Hope you're enjoying the little thing here, Q&A. Troy, I used to do a lot of scales, holding and isolating the jaw and tongue to eliminate them from my bad habit of them. Three new vids, got it. You're welcome, Troy. Welcome, Cedric. Cedric, 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 how are you doing? Chime in. Cedric was a, uh, a cool student that I worked with this last spring in, um, in France, in Marseille, France. Uh, super cool. Hey. <laughs> Zuper, Zuper, en <on> bonjour. <laughs> Cedric. Let us know how you're doing, Cedric. Um, Troy, I used to do a lot of scales, holding and isolating the jaw and tongue. Man, you know what? I've heard about this hold your tongue idea. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> Uh, I don't advocate holding on to your tongue uh, for really anything, um, um, especially singing or training. I don't. Uh, maybe there's something there, but I don't get it. I think it's sort of silly and stupid. Troy, don't hold on to your tongue. I have a better idea for you. Sort of holding on to your tongue. Take the tip of your tongue 
and leverage it against the back of your bottom teeth. Teeth, tip of the tongue, right here. Okay, do that and be mindful of it. Feel it, feel the tip of your tongue touching your teeth. Be, be aware of that when you're singing your vowels. That's a much better solution than holding onto your tongue, it's ridiculous. I understand you're not doing that now, but um, don't do it ever. Let's go see if we got some questions on here. Yeah, well, um, the horizontal embouchure is, uh, Kevin, the horizontal embouchure is a form of isolation. It, um, it's, 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 it's really chilling out the jawbone movement, okay? Um, and sort of isolating the articulation required to have good diction for the lyrics, if you will, to the tongue, upper vocal tract and palate and trying to chill out the jaw a little bit. Now, you're never gonna be able to stop moving the jaw entirely, that's expecting too much, but you can sort of chill it out a little bit. And again, I, I, it tends to be very helpful. Um, the tongue has to, I mean, unless you're singing through a vowel, the tongue has to articulate. Javen, assigning mass has been one of many game changers for my students. Can we hear your description of it? You Maestro Gray. Holding tongue is nonsense. Absolutely. Holding tongue is ridiculous. Thank you. Gabrielle Ligazzi. Gabrielle Ligazzi. <laughs> Gabrielle Ligazzi. <laughs> All right. You guys go out, listen to Gabe sing. Gabe is a certified instructor at TVS. We trained together for years. We did a master class together in Italy. Uh, in my career, as a, as a voice coach and singer when I get a chance to, uh, when I think about like some of the greatest, most, most gifted, most gifted singers that I personally know, uh, Gabriele Gazzi, go listen to this guy sing. Good to see you again. Glad you can. Send me a personal email, let me know what you're up to. I'd like to understand more about how you're training. I know you've been working on some distortion stuff. Uh, Javen, I'll get to it. Mass. Yeah, I was using way too much muscle. Absolutely. Frank, welcome, Frank. What's up? <laughs> What's up, Holmes? <laughs> Gabriele Gazzi. All right, I'll share a Gabriele Gazzi story. I remember I was on, I was doing these masterclass tours in Europe, I was in Italy. Gabriele Gazzi picked me up at the airport. I don't know, I was like, I'd been on the road for like three weeks. Gabriele Gazzi picked me up the, at the airport. We couldn't get out of the parking lot. And I, I, I specifically remember you saying, Gabe, I, we were in your car, I remember you saying, like you were trying to get the, the thing to open to, so we could get out of the airport parking lot. And I'll never forget, you said, freaking fucking Italy. <laughs> freaking, freaking fucking Europe. Freaking fuck in Italy, you know, sort of complaining that it wasn't working or whatever. I don't know, but I just remember that. And then I went back to um, Gabe's home, absolutely gorgeous uh, place his parents have there, wonderful, and crashed. <laughs> Do you remember that, Gabe? I was just like, just, just give me, give me a pillow, and I was like, oh, boom, it just crashed in Gabe's room. <laughs> I hope you're doing great, man. I miss you. It can help me. I want to get back up here and answer Kevin or uh, Draven. Draven has a question about mass. All right, cool. Mass. The mass of your foundations. It's in the book, it's in the course. Those of you guys that have the course, I believe it's in. Um, I believe it's in the the uh, myth busting module. Go out to the mass of your phonations. I think it's called the mass of your phonations. Now, when we talk about mass, um, that's really just a metaphor for weight. Okay, so I have this 
this microphone has a mass to it, right? I can feel its weight, okay? So mass is just referring to, it's a metaphor, it's sort of a visualization thing that, that gets us all as singers thinking about creating the awareness of, of, of assigning a mass, an imaginary mass. Actually, in some regards, it's not imaginary. It's actually real when you talk about what the vocal folds are doing in the level push. But where we're going to assign a mass to every phonation, okay? So we have um, the way this game works. We've got three, three masses, three masses, light, medium, and heavy, okay? This is a light mass phonation. Okay, just light, it's light, it's floaty, it's pretty. This is a medium mass phonation. Right? You can hear it's a little more amplified, a little bit heavier, uh, probably more, more respiration, a little bit more vocal fold um, engagement. And, and we, we, we tend to say that light and medium is sort of what we want. What we don't want is heavy mass. Okay, now there might be some exceptions. In that example, you heard some distortion. So if I'm performing a recording or making a point about vocal distortion with my students, a moment, a brief moment of heavy mass might be fine. It just sort of depends on the context. But for the sake of this conversation, what you want to do, what I encourage you guys to do, is visualize every single phonation, especially beginners that are learning how to sing, not, you know, maybe not the guys that have been doing this for years, okay? This is beginner stuff. Visualize every phonation to have a mass, okay? And try to make every phonation when you're training and singing be light or medium, and try not to make it heavy. Now, what light, medium, and heavy means is, uh, means to you is, is what it means or how do we define that is based on the individual. So you just have to sort of decide for yourself, okay, what is light, medium, and heavy for yourself. Now, why is this important? Why are we doing this? Um, what this does is it gets you, gets you thinking about the push factor. As we all knew, as we all know, all singers to one degree or another, at one time or another in their, in their, in their singing career and experience, find themselves pushing too hard. Okay, that's just the sport of singing, all right? And if you simply become aware of, of singing light, medium, or heavy mass phonations, then what happens is, is it sort of, it enables you, it gives you permission to throttle back. Um, that which you are not aware of is something that you can't fix. If you're not aware of it, if you're not conscious of really anything, but in this example, the weight or the mass of your phonation, then it's gonna be that much more difficult to fix the problem, right? Um, you don't know what you don't know. That's sort of where this is going. On the other hand, if you train and think about, okay, I'm gonna do si onsets and sirens, or I'm gonna sing my song, I'm gonna sing a journey song, and I'm gonna make sure that I never get more than a medium mass. It'll be light or medium all the way. And if I feel myself going to a heavy mass where it's pushing and gripping, I'm gonna, fall, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll back, throttle back, and keep it at a medium or light mass. You see what that does? Just associating a weight to every phonation, training and singing, begins to create awareness for the singer to help self-coach yourself as you're going, all right? It's like getting your eyes on the road. That's what the mass of a phonation idea um, in the book and in the course is about. Um, and you know what, it's super helpful, especially if you're a beginner and you're pushing, it's really helpful to say, okay, all right, keep it lighter medium, lighter medium, lighter medium, lighter medium. It can, it can help a lot. Now, that's a little bit of the, uh, 
sort of the uh, auditory imagery, the visualization aspect to this idea. <clears throat> but there's a real, a real tangible aspect to this idea as well in regards to mass. Um, when we are singing in heavier masses, there tends to be, there tends to be um, more respiration and there tends to be more um, engagement on the vocal folds, okay? So you could say that it's not just a visualization game, it's also quite literally referring to real tangible mass in regards to vocal fold uh, engagement and respiration. Hey, this whole thing needs to be balanced. If you're blowing too hard and squeezing too hard, you've got too much mass and it's not gonna work, you're gonna choke and, and squeeze. So I hope that answers your question. Um, good question, Kevin. Or Draven, excuse me. Juan Pablo Palencia. Welcome, Juan. <laughs> Back in the day, Lenti would say in my lessons on mass, lean into it. Ah, okay, well, if I was telling you to lean into your mass, that was that was us working together with the massive phonation visualization technique. And I was probably, I probably just like, there's not enough compression. There's not enough wind. There's not enough, you know, TA engagement. There's not enough musculature engagement. It's just too wimpy, right? So when I say lean into it, that typically means add a little more mass. Yeah. By that, I mean lean into the resonance, not necessarily mean pushing. Lean into the resonance. Mm. Troy, I don't know how you would lean into resonance. I can, I can sort of see how you would lean into vocal compression and, 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 and sort of physiology elements. You can lean into it. But I'm not sure you can lean into resonance other than uh, maybe ensuring that you edge the vowels and you get the resonance forward to the hard palate. That could be, you know, instead of resonating back here in a soft palate, resonating forward to the hard palate, that could be um, leaning, but never use it that way. Juan, what do you got? A question related to what you are saying about mass. All right, we've got six minutes, and then I have to go back to work. If I go to light mass, I don't get enough compression. Then it's too light. If you're not getting compression, if you're just training and it's just wind, then it's – unless you're trying to have a windy vocal effect because you're singing a, a love song or something, fine. But that's, I know that's not the context. That's not what you're talking about. If you're training and you've got wind, then that's not a, that's, that's, that's too light. All right. One, you got to get your compression going. Uh huh. And head voice, of course. How to engage good compression, but keep it light, massive, what good. All right. So Juan is saying, well, when I'm in my head voice, it's, it's, it's windy. Okay. Uh, um, it's probably very falsetto-ish, right? Falsetto is a physical mode characterized by too much respiration, bleeding through the glottis, all right? And Juan is essentially saying, hey, when I'm training and I'm in my head voice, it's windy, how do I get more mass? How do I get more compression in my vocal folds? Great question, and I have a great solution for you, okay? Write this down, Juan, write this down, okay? One, go to the course and watch the new lectures on cry mode, how to get into cry mode, and then I want you to practice singing in cry mode, okay? Two, one, go to the course and watch the lecture and the training video. There's both a lecture and a training video on the quack and release onset, the quack and release onset. That will bring, give you compression in the head voice. Also, go to the course and watch the lecture 
and view the demonstration video on the attack and release onset. The attack and release onset or glottal attacks. Um, onsets into pure bowels. Okay. Four, go to the course, go to the book and watch the lecture and the demonstration video on the contract and release onset. The contract and release onset. It's a, it's a, it's a muscly, bulky movement that helps build connectivity and compression in the head voice. Okay? And um, then, once you practice those onsets and you're getting good at them, you're gonna, you're gonna do them one note at a time, okay? On the keyboard, all the way up to your head voice, and then back down. And once you feel like you've got those onsets working nicely, you got, you got some motor skills going, then you're going to put those onsets, the quack and release, the attack and release, and the contract and release onsets in front of sirens and other workouts, okay? So when we master these onsets and then we sort of plug them into uh, um, a vocal workout, all right, and then choose a vowel, that is really the TVS methodology in its essence, okay? Onsets, vowels, and training content, vocal leaks all stuck together in a way that makes sense, that's intelligent, that solves your unique problem. Okay. Now, out on the training page, in the course on the training page, you will find five, five strength building integrated training routines. All right, where we've taken these onsets, we plug them into a workout, and we've chosen a vowel, and then you train them. And that's gonna help you get connectivity in the head voice, all right? So you're gonna work individual onsets, the ones I just told you, then you're gonna put the onsets on the move, starting with sirens, and then move to the rest of the workouts. Okay, great question, and I got a great solution for you. It's in the program, all right? Send me an email if you have any questions on that. And what do we got? Stuart Hayes do. <laughs> From across the water. Oh, you must be in Europe. Hey, Sean. Lean into resonance versus mass separates push effort from volume resonance. Okay. Stuart must be in Europe or something. Sean. Okay, guys, I'm going to wrap it. That's it. Um, great questions. Great questions. Um, if you'd like to know more about the method and the training and what we do here, and the people that have been training the program, go out to thevocalistudio.com, right? We can get a book and an online course and uh, learn these techniques and train. Train to get strong and build motor skills for, for singing. It works. The stuff works if you commit to it and you learn the method. Um, also, we have a light version out of Udemy that you guys can pick up as well. I'll see you guys here next Thursday. And um, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. It was fun today.